This week, Dylan Horrocks talks about his comic Hicksville, 20 years after the release of the first collection. Hicksville commented on the comics industry, but in light of events in the intervening years, did it go too far or not far enough? Dylan Horrocks talks with Emmett in a moment. This is a flashback episode of Deconstructing Comics 598 from July 2nd, 2018. As always, a reminder that you can support the podcast by pledging a few bucks a month at patreon.com slash deconcomics. At $4 a month, you can hear our monthly podcast on Jim Starlin's Captain Marvel run. Or if you'd rather give a one-time donation, you can do so via PayPal by sending it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. This is Emma. This is Dylan. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Right. I had an introduction for this interview all lined up in my head, and I've just decided to abandon it. Because how <laughs> do you summarize Dylan Horrocks' Hicksville? I mean, you can make the attempt, um, but I've got the man himself on the line here, so I figured I would just put it to you. 20 years later, Dylan, what is Hicksville to you right now? Oh, good grief. <laughs> yeah. It's just Lobbing um... that ball at you. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because my um, my kids are now um, in their twenties too, and yeah. it feels a little like that. It's uh, Hicksville has been there for so long now in in my life that <laughs> it's it's uh, it's just this complex part of the family. Mm. Um, I mean, it was my first book, and uh, it was seven years in the making. And I poured into it everything that was on my mind, really, over those seven years about comics, about art, about my thoughts about the world. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it is a little hard to sum it up, I guess. <laughs> um, I'll tell you a story. Um, whenever I want to introduce somebody to comics or give them a sense of comics, I mean, there's there's various books that people have as a favorite handout to people um sort of text introduction to comics i know some people hand out watchmen i don't know why you'd introduce somebody to comics with watchmen um (laughs) a bit bit involved but i give people hicksville uh because it's comics about comics it's comic book comics and as you say you put all yourself into it from the 90s it's such a snapshot of the comics landscape from the 1990s as well um, everything from the indie scene to the first movements of comics into film, you touch on that quite directly. Um, in fact, for this interview, yesterday I had to rush out and buy a fresh copy of uh, Hixel because I lent it out to another Kiwi, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we never buy books. Kiwis, <laughs> <laughs> They're so expensive in New Zealand, you just get used to borrowing them all the time. <laughs> so it's out, in, it's out in the wild somewhere. Um but it is a book that I keep coming back to, and part of that is because you there's so many points of entry to the book as well. Um, it, the story, uh, just for those who haven't read it, the story concerns a comics journalist, Leonard Batts, who visits the town of Hicksville trying to track down the beginnings of a now very successful comics writer, Dick Berger. Um, he meets uh, Sam Sable, who has become... He's now seen in a lot of press about you as something of a stand-in for you. Um, mm. He meets Grace, and her. we learn about her love triangle with characters Danton and Coupe. And he also meets Mrs. Hicks, who is the owner of a library with every comic ever published residing in the town of Hicksville. <laughs> and people in Hicksville, as you say, they just keep borrowing books. They're, everyone's borrowing That's comics. That's right. It's so a nobody's buying them. Um, <laughs> And that is one of the joys of Hicksville, this town where everybody reads comics. There is no commercial imperative to make comics. People just make stories and they share them in this place. And that's why it's such a special place. Um, the, you're saying a lot there in terms of what comics are. And there is this theme in the book that it's almost <coughs> money ruins comics or the emphasis on commercial success ruins comics. Is that something that you we're thinking of directly um not not in quite so 
such a clear um, construction. I guess, uh, you know, I was trying to build a career in comics for myself. Um, I was living in England when I started the story, so I'd gone overseas to, to London for a few years. And my intention was to arrive in England and start working in the comics industry there and then, you know, build a career perhaps in European comics. Mm. Um, but uh, it didn't really pan out that way. And so I spent much of that time in England working in a bookstore and wrestling with the the, the difficulties of um, making a living out of comics or trying to find a way to make a living out of comics. So... Um, you know, that was very much in the back of my mind. I really was at an early stage there where I was very focused on trying to make it work as a career. I guess in a way I still am. Mm. <laughs> so it feels like a lifelong lifelong journey. I, it, I think um, working in any, you know, being obsessed with any art form at some point, if you're trying to make it the focus of your life, you come up against that question of... Um, how do I make that work financially? Mm. And uh, it's very difficult because when it does work, you know, there have been times in my life where um, I was earning reasonable money doing comics, particularly after Hicksville when I was writing for DC Comics for a few years. And um, when it is working financially, then you come up against all the pressures to make the stories you're telling commercial and to to write stories that will fit with the requirements of um, the commercial market. And and then your relationship with your work changes too. It turns into a job. It, it's All these compromises start pressing down on what you're trying to write. Um, so it, it's a bit of a no-win um, thing, the, 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 you know, the relationship between the commercial aspects and and just wanting to do it as as, as a vocation. Mm. Um, so I uh, yeah I the the main in Hicksville I guess the one of the big questions is um, throughout the history of comics uh, why why have so many of the you know uh, is this is there a great library of of um, masterpieces in comics that never happened because of the pressures of that commercial industry yeah. uh, and and that's one of the questions I was wrestling with at the time you know the history of comics how how um, the the financial constraints of the industry shaped that history and shaped the work that people did and most importantly what they didn't do as well yeah and it's interesting because a lot of reviews of Hicksville have mentioned Mrs. Hicks's library in relation to uh, Borges, you know, and you have the idea of the um, impossible library of books that never were. But in yeah. Hicksville, it's it's not a magical thing. But it's, it's, it, it seems magical, but it's a place where people go to. Um, American comic readers have been going to Hicksville to produce those works they couldn't uh, produce in their circumstances elsewhere. And yeah. it's a very sort of ready-to-hand idea of a library. Well, there are two libraries in Hicksville, and, and one of them is um, is the library of all the comics that have ever been published. And I, I hope this isn't giving away a terrible spoiler at this point, but um, the other library is the library beneath the lighthouse, um, what I think of as the lighthouse library. And that's the, the library of all the comics that should have existed. Mm. Um, but, but didn't, and that's the very Borgesian one, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I kind of liked the the uh, the energy that was created between those two libraries um, in the town of Hicksville, and the fact that the the library of comics that could have existed but didn't is beneath the lighthouse is significant because the lighthouse serves as both a, a warning, a warning to people not to crash on the rocks, mm. um, but also it serves as a kind of a beacon. It, it's drawing people 
into a place of safety, to a safe harbor. Uh, and there's the final sequence in Hicksville, um, the library, uh, sorry, the lighthouse also appears as a crow's nest um, in a ship for the lookout to try and work out where we're going. And I liked the idea of constructing this imaginary history of comics, a history that didn't exist but could have existed. Mm. Uh, all those books that could have been done. And then using that that body of work, that imaginary history, as a, a, um, a, a point of reference for us carving out a future for comics yep. so that we could try and create the future of comics that we might have had if that history had actually happened mm. uh, rather than feeling bound to the history we've had very good and and uh, each uh, a number of the chapters that in Hicks will lead off with these sort of epigrammatic asides from or quotes from um, comic creators who have faced struggles in producing their work and there's this almost regretful air to a lot of what they're saying um, again sort of lighting the way for those who come after them saying look be careful kid you're going into comics things are tough here the quote that, that, that is now endlessly requoted um, is the line from Jack Kirby that opens the book I was going. To, I was going to bring this up with you now because you've gotten a bit of trouble on this one because I, <coughs> I've read people <laughs> quoting that the Jack, you know, comics will break your heart, and people were saying, "Where did he get this quote from?" So can I put yeah. it to you? Where did you get that quote from? Yeah, well, it's it's um, kind of a fun story. I was standing in a comic shop in Auckland, flicking through new graphic novels years ago, mm-hmm. and one of them was Seven Miles Per Second. Um, and uh, which was a Vertigo book, a really good graphic novel. And the, um, at the back of the book was the author biographies and the artist of the book, James Romberger. In his, it said, uh, James was once told by Jack Kirby, comics will break your heart. Mm. And I immediately, you know, as soon as I read those words, I thought, Bam! I, you know, that's <laughs> I have got to use that line. Yeah. Um, and so I noted it down, and then sometime later, when I was putting together Hicksville as a as a book, because it was first serialized in a comic book pickle, which mm. I did for Black Eye in the nineties, um, I thought that's that is the perfect opening line for the book, uh, and so I used it, but but subsequently. You know, people started asking me, "Where the hell did you get that quote?" You know, I've never, <laughs> I've never yeah. seen that quote in any of the interviews, and um, so I tell them, you know, I got it from. It was a, a line that James Romberger used at the back of Seven Miles Per Second, and um, eventually, so many people were asking me, I ended up talking to James online, and mm. he told me the whole story around that which was that as a young a young artist who wanted to be a cartoonist he was at a convention and he met Jack Kirby in a lift and um, and he showed Jack Kirby his portfolio of work and Jack Kirby flipped through and then looked at him and said you know kid if <laughs> comics will break your heart and tried to persuade James to go into gallery work instead of comics Mm. um, which James did and James has combined both comics and uh, a career exhibiting in galleries ever since Um, now more recently there was a a more active discussion on that because since then you know I guess because of Hicksville that that quote has entered the um, entered the uh, the record and people quote it all the time online um and and actually, I've seen it quoted in other books now. Too. Yeah, it's spreading. Uh, it's, yeah, it's like it's like Borges again. You know, this <coughs> idea of an idea that's sort of infecting us now. It's everywhere. It's well, you know, language is a virus. Yes. Um, and uh, so there was a more recent discussion, and all sorts of people got involved in that, um, and various people saying that's you know that's. I never heard Jack Kirby say that. But actually, Mark Avenier, who worked with Jack Kirby 
for some time in his later years, uh, said that he heard um, Kirby say those words or very similar words multiple times to people at conventions and so on. So, um, I, to me, that 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 backed up James's story, and James is pretty, you know, he's quite firm. I think James got a little bit annoyed by by the whole discussion because he um, he pro- you know he might. I felt a little embarrassed that that my book had become the the gateway for that quote mm. um, spreading when really it's James's story. <laughs> so yeah. I, I'm always trying to credit James for that story because um, you know it was his experience. Oh, fair play. I mean, and 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 it's good to attribute it to him. Uh, but yeah, if if Mark Evenier say it's happened, it's probably it definitely happened because he. Well, I figure that was you know, yeah. that was good good backup for it and whether kirby did say it or not um he's not the only cartoonist to have expressed yes. the same view and there's an almost identical quote from charlie from um, charles schultz yes who uh was in with i think that was from an interview late in his life with gary groth perhaps i'm trying to remember the details of that one yeah i have a, you know i've got 30 years of notebooks and journals stacked on a shelf and I was going through them the other day and realized I had quotes peppered through them that I'd noted down from some interview and only sometimes that I'd note down where it yeah. came from so it <laughs> takes a bit of uh, digging sometimes very good um, okay well I also wanted to touch on the use of geography <laughs> in Hicksville um, so in 1998 Hicksville is is it was it first collected in 1998 or was it first released in 1998? You first collected, so it was serialized in Pickle, Pickle. really from about 1992 to 1997, and then the very last chapter, actually, that that issue of Pickle never came out because the publisher was about to <laughs> about to fold, mm. and and he said, "Shall we bring out the last issue of Pickle or shall we bring out the book?" And um, we went with the book. Good. So that was in 98. Um, so in 1998, New Zealand seemed very, very far away. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, asking my lovely publisher, who was based in Canada, Michelle Vrana, you know, when I was doing Pickle, I said, is it okay that this is so New Zealand? The stories are obsessed with New Zealand and full of New Zealand details. And, mm. You know, is that a problem for a North American audience? And he said, oh, no, it's great. They love it. It's exotic. <laughs> so, I don't know if New Zealand's quite so exotic anymore. Well, yeah, it's it's certainly been brought into the world more. Um, I mean, Leonard has all this trouble getting to Hicksville. Um, he's cut off from his um, editor at Comics World magazine. Uh, he's constantly asking to use a fax machine. People don't have fax machines. Um, <laughs> so the internet is not factoring in yet. At one point, well, he mentions yeah. he would he would like to use an email if he could find a modem. Um, so he's been reduced to writing a letter. Uh, yeah. And it's it's funny to me because now people are um, taken to writing letters again, so they can get off social media because it's become too in- <laughs> it's become too intrusive. We're trying to get away from the internet. Um, so it, it's it's not only Hicksville is not only a snapshot of the time in terms of what comics were doing then in in, in the nineties, but it's also uh, your perception of. Uh, New Zealand and how far away from New Zealand you were for a time of the writing of this because you were in London um, yeah. and then just conveying that sense of distance and on top of that you've got this recurring motif of the uh, cartographers in the book um, this idea of mapping and I think that relates to what you were talking about before with the um, lighthouse as well there's this sense of trying to find out where you are in relation to where you have to where you were and it, it, it's all, it all, every reading I keep coming back to that idea of mapping as well and what you're saying about comics and maps. Um, so the, this is a bit of a jumbled question, Dylan, but uh, geography <laughs> seems to be one of, the, one of the, the, the run through of this theme here. Yeah, I, I'm obsessed with maps and geography, um, possibly thanks to uh, discovering fantasy novels when I was a kid oh, and becoming... you, you got the little map at the beginning of the book that the authors put in to give you a sense of the fantastical it, world. Exactly, you know, well, the, yeah. all the best novels have a map at the beginning. Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess um, 
in Hicksville, I was I was trying to explore both the place of comics in the world, but also the place of New Zealand in the world. Mm. And both of them, certainly at the time, felt um, very marginal. Uh, New Zealand was at the bottom of the world um, and absolutely the edge of the kind of cultural map of the world. Uh, people outside New Zealand didn't really pay attention to it or even know it was there half the time. I remember in 1980, we spent um, uh, Christmas in San Francisco and my brother uh, was talking to an American girl at a bar and she said, oh, you know, what an amazing accent you have. Where are you from? And he said, I'm from New Zealand. And she said, where's that? Never heard of it. And, and so he spun, spun this entire story about how it was behind the Iron Curtain <laughs> and, um, and told this amazing saga about how he'd escaped from the, the Eastern Bloc and made his way to America. And she just, she believed every word of it because she had no idea about where New Zealand was. Um, so, yeah, New Zealand felt very much like it was at the edge of the world. And comics felt the same. We were absolutely at the margins of the... Um, cultural map that, that we weren't taken seriously by anyone, um, people weren't paying attention to what was going on and um, what I wanted to do was point out that a, a, a square map is an illusion that, that the earth is actually a sphere and mm. the surface of a sphere has no centre or, or edge. Wherever you are on that sphere looking out you're at the centre of the world from your own point of view. So partly what I was trying to do was um, draw a kind of imaginary map of the world in which both New Zealand and comics were you know, the most... And I, I positioned Hicksville at the absolute edge of New Zealand too. It's on the east mo easternmost edge of the country in a very remote area on the East Cape. Um, so I was trying to say, you know, where you are is the centre. Now look out and see how the world looks with that as the centre. Um, and trying to trying to get a sense of what the whole landscape of art and literature and culture and history looks like from that, that vantage point. Um, but I just, I find, I, I tend to fall back on geographical metaphors all the time it's, it's just it's so second nature to me um the most substantial essay i've ever written about comics is one about scott mcleod and um one of the focuses of that essay one of the great delights of writing that essay was going through not only understanding comics but um but reinventing comics and finding all the geographical metaphors he was using, it's absolutely full. His work is full of uh, mapping and landscape metaphors. Uh, and then kind of trying to take his, his, deconstruct his work based on metaphors and seeing where that led us. Um, and the, the cartographers in Hicksville are, they're, so there are, there are, three cartographers in effect in one storyline which is about New Zealand the islands of New Zealand coming adrift and they're floating across the ocean and um, Captain Cook who was the first English uh, cartographer to map the to circumnavigate the whole country and map that um, and Honeheke who was a, uh, a northern a Māori from northern New Zealand who um, led a conflict with the British troops in the early 1800s, which was really about trying to define who owned the landscape of New Zealand and who would define the future. Um, and they team up with uh, an artist as well, who's actually, whose identity actually shifts slightly in the course of the book, but he was basically... Um, based on Charles Seafee. Mm. Uh, so they're, they're all trying to work at, trying to locate New Zealand in the world, and it's because 
the islands are drifting and they no longer have any firm reference points. And in a, in, in a way, that's what it felt like for New Zealand, mm. um, for me growing up, is that the old narratives about New Zealand's place in the world, which were very much the colonial narratives, um, constructed out of our sense of being part of the British Empire, those had evaporated. We no longer, they weren't useful anymore. Um, but we hadn't really constructed a new picture of where we were in the world. Um, and I feel like comics have, you know, they've gone through similar processes of trying to um, work out how we fit in. In the 80s and 90s, there was a real uh, push to redefine our place in the cultural landscape. Um, just as the term graphic novel was rising to prominence as well. Yeah, and uh, one thought I had as well about just Coupe's role as being the lighthouse keeper and the keeper of the, the secret library was this relationship of comics and mapping, again, um, a sense of, well, the, the in indigenous characters, they had a sense of where New Zealand was. They had a sense that they had done their own mapping, and then this Western cartographer comes along and says, "Well, this is where it is." But a map from a Westerner is is describing something which is already described by other people, but it's seeming trying to replace their description of the thing. Um, and th there there's some significance to the fact that Coupe is is himself Maori uh, in that in that tradition of well, we already know where we are. Yeah. And comics are, are something we were already doing. Uh, the sense of telling stories, true pictures, is something we were already doing. The comics <laughs> is presented as something new. Yeah, actually, there's um, one of my favorite uh, names for comics is the one that's uh, so in the in the 90s. Um, there was a new dictionary of Maori published here, which was. Um, kind of updating the language it included uh, various terms that that for you know for things that hadn't existed in the 1700s in New Zealand um, and there was a lovely term for comics which is uh, Ngā Pakiwai Tuhi yeah. and um, Pakiwai basically means stories but it's um, there are various connotations it carries around what kind of stories but but tuhi is this wonderful word which means writing, it means drawing, painting, carving. Basically, it's anything that involves making a mark um, in order to convey something or communicate something. Mm. And I, I love that term because um, it means it's describing comics as stories told using words slash pictures you know it's it's whatever it takes to tell that story you can you can use mm. um and actually that's that uh, you know like many cartoonists i've been ambivalent about the way the term graphic novel has come to be a kind of uh it's seen by a lot of people outside comics as a more respectable or um almost politically correct term for comics so I, you know, when I talk to librarians or academics, they often um, they use graphic novel to describe any kind of comics. Mm. Um, I was once asked by a by a library actually if I if I would be willing to draw a graphic novel for them, and I thought, bloody hell! Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just check what I'm doing for the next ten years, because it does take me a long time to draw these things, and. Uh, as we talked further, it became clear that what they were actually wanting was a three-panel comic strip. Oh, okay. and they just—they when I said, "Oh God, I thought you meant like a book," because a graphic novel is a book-length comic, and they and they said, "Oh, I thought graphic novel was just the the preferred term now because comics is so negative and disparaging." Yeah. Um, it's that it's that virus of language again, replacing terms. Yeah, 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 and you know the terms we use, just like the, just like, colonial cartographers came and um, renamed, mm. renamed the landscape in order to redefine it as something that was part of their positions. Um, you know the the renaming of comics is also a hotly contested issue, but, but, 
I did. I have to say, I warmed to the term graphic novel more recently when I realised that the term graphic um, comes from a Greek word graphos, which actually meant something like tuhi. It was used for writing. It was used for drawing. Um, it was used for, again, you know, making a mark that communicated something. So, I now feel slightly warmer towards that. <laughs> nice. Coming up, how the character of Dick Berger seems more real now than he did 20 years ago. The explosion of female comics creators, especially outside of the big two. How the internet has changed for the worse, and more. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon, and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting this show every week. We really appreciate your support. Hey, I'm Jen. And I'm Sean. We're here to tell you about our podcast, Worst Collection Ever. And this is the show where we tell you about the worst comic book collection in existence. And it just happens to belong to us. We have some of the worst comics from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. They're bad. They don't, Terrible. They're not worth anything. No good. Why do we Very own them? Bad. I own a number of issues of Terror, Inc. and Guy Gardner. Basically, we go around to local comic book stores and we buy everything we can out of dollar boxes. We tell you about the weird stuff in them. We tell you about stuff that's related to them. We go into tangents. And we're very uninformed, so... Oh my god, totally. But totally check out our podcast because you'll hear us just talk and joke about Marvel books and DC books from God only knows when. That's right. It's our show, Worst Collection Ever, every Tuesday on iTunes, Stitcher, anywhere you get your podcasts. Download, rate, subscribe, tell a friend. It'll be good and terrible, but good. Um, I wanted to take a quick side step for a moment. You mentioned uh, Scott McCloud, and I just happened to be reading an interview with him in uh, Hillary... Um, it's a Hillary Schutz book. She's got a, a book of interviews with cartoonists. Right. And there's a section where he's talking about criticism of understanding comics. And he says, um, the stuff in chapter six, show and tell about words and pictures, the separation of words and pictures, and their reuniting. I think that's considered overly simplistic my whole definition of art gets a lot of flack although i've never heard a good alternative he goes on to describe um something samuel or delaney said and then he comes back with um dylan horrocks probably wrote the most interesting reaction to the book something called inventing comics and that was your um geography metaphor again wasn't it where you were talking about the landscape of yep. comics so, uh, yeah, he gave you a shout-out. Well, that's nice. I mean, when after that essay was published in the Comics Journal, um, I ended up meeting up, I met up with Scott mm. and his family for lunch. And um, he, it was so lovely because he, he just was delighted by the essay. <laughs> Some people read the essay as, you know, really um, attacking, attacking Scott's book. But, um, but I, He's so he's so delighted to be able to have a an in depth discussion about this stuff, and yeah. uh, it's you know um, I don't know if you know the book um, Metaphors We Live By by Lakoff and Johnson, and know. it's in that book. Um, I mean, they, what they're talking about is the way the metaphors that we use in language shape the way we see the world mm. and the way and. Uh, th- one example they give is that you can, a lot of the metaphors we use, we talk about arguing are um, combative metaphors. They're about warfare and fighting. You know, you you defeat your opponent, you crush your opponent, you, you uh, um, defend your position and so on. So they're military metaphors. But they they said, you know, there's an alternative way of looking at an argument, and that's that it's a collaborative, a collaborative process where you're trying to, between the two of you, more clearly define and establish the truth or, or the 
details of a position. Um, and I, that is totally how Scott is. <laughs> he really is one of these people who genuinely loves to have a collaborative argument. And mm. uh, so it's always such an enormous pleasure uh, arguing with him. <laughs> it's such, such a treat. <laughs> He's got a lot to say, and he's uh, a little more interested in just getting to the whys of things as opposed to what he thinks. Or yeah, and he's um, always so interesting. Everything he writes is hmm. fascinating because it's operating on so many levels. And that's like you know when people people argue about um, about understanding comics, most of the time they're not paying attention to the visual metaphors he's filling it with, or the uh, you know it's ironic because. It, it's it's a, he's done it as a comic for a reason. <laughs> mm. he's, he's not just uh, providing a text and then adding some padding with illustrations. The the visual metaphors matter. They're absolutely central to how he's constructing his argument. Mm. Um, okay, so I mentioned before that Leonard comes to Hicksville looking to learn more about Dick Berger, and. What I love about the book is your your depiction of Dick Berger's success, this <coughs> extreme success, um, uh, and his uh, compl- his indulgent wealth and all the things he's doing. Um, I, in this in this book, success is making movies and not taking calls from Todd McFarlane, <laughs> <laughs> which I love. Um, yeah, he also brushes off Stan Lee at one he point. He does, he does. He was desperate to collaborate with him. Um, um, can I ask you, have you seen Deadpool 2 yet? You know, I, I my confession is that I, I avoid superhero movies. I haven't even seen the first Deadpool one. Okay, um, okay. well, you, yeah. you, don't, you don't need to see the first one. But something interesting occurred to me last night when I was reading Hexville. So, in Deadpool 2... Julian Dennison, who's an Australian actor, uh, sorry, New Zealand actor, sorry, this ruins the point, <laughs> New Zealand actor. You know, most Australian actors seem to start out as New Zealand actors, but never <laughs> mind. Russell Crowe, yeah. Um, <laughs> Julian Dennison, he was in um, Hunt for the Wilder People with Sam Neill. Yeah. Um, he plays a character in Deadpool 2 who calls himself Fire Fist, and he is a disturbed young kid who is he's been brought up in an orphanage and he's got all sorts of problems and emotional problems and he lashes out with his fire powers that's that's the part of the plot of the Deadpool 2 and then I'm reading Hicksville and you've got Dick Berger's teenage comic <laughs> and it's about a disturbed kid and his name is Fireboy <laughs> and he shows it to his idol, his comic creator idol, who says, Kid, are you okay? And I immediately thought of Fire Fist. <laughs> and, and Julian Dennison, being New Zealand as well, it's just, it just it, it's this perfect loop in my head. It's but delicious. maybe it's just to me. <laughs> That's just too good. I, You know, the funny thing about that is that... Um, when I look at Hicksville now, which I only do usually when someone thrusts it at me to get it signed, um, it it strikes me that, that the whole world of comic book success that I present in that book didn't really exist when I did, when I drew that story. Um, Dick Berger's massive uh, wealth and his um, importance in the film world and the the, the fact that he leveraged his success to, to take over a big, you know, now runs a huge media conglomerate. Um, there wasn't, it didn't really exist back then. A successful cartoonist could maybe, I mean, the most successful cartoonists at the time were people like Todd McFarlane, mm. who, because of image and because Marvel had started paying royalties and so on, they... I think it was a story going around. I think it was Todd McFarlane or one of those image guys um, had a private helicopter, um, and that was like that was absolutely the pinnacle of where you could get to in comics. But the idea that they would also dominate something like um, Time Warner, mm-hmm. the idea that superheroes could be the central. Uh, you know the most successful franchises in the entertainment world. Uh, that just, 
I, you know, I kept thinking I was pushing it too far. It was ridiculous. I was going much too far in the story. But now, you know, I look at it and I think, oh, I, he looks like small fry now. <laughs> Comics has become absolutely central to the entertainment industry. It's, it's absolutely surreal. Yeah, and then um, the mythologization of Stan Lee has continued. I know. Now he's, he's, this, he's all over all these movies. He keeps appearing in all these movies, and there are kids today who would never have read a comic, but they know who Stan Lee is. Yeah, I mean, Dick Berger now um, feels more, more, um, you know, the, the, I don't know, he's, he's more real now than he ever yeah. was. It's a very strange feeling. But also, what you've predicted there is it, it, it forms in line from with your theme of the marginalization of comics because what's happening today is comics are being made into a film and the, the films are taking off and having huge success but the comics are being that they are sourced from are being left behind people aren't necessarily yeah. going to the stores to read the comics these films are based on and I feel yeah that's you, right you, and I was just sorry I was just going to say I feel you anticipated all of that yeah, I, I didn't consciously where is this going? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it is it is strange. I mean when I was working for D C uh, that was during the I guess, it was the early two thousands and it it was the time when superhero movies really were starting to become mm. um, they were just starting to become a really big um, thing. And um, even then, there was this strange disconnect between the, the the constantly growing success of the films. They were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more lucrative. Um, and the fact that the actual comics industry, the mainstream comics industry, seemed to be continuing its decline, <laughs> its sort of slow, painful decline. And... Uh, the sales figures on the comics that were considered successful were about at the level which in the 40s and 50s they would have been considered catastrophically unsuccessful and cancelled. Um, yeah, it was a very... Um, it's a totally bizarre industry. Uh, <laughs> I'll never get my head around it. But at the same time... Um, Graphic novels and sort of independent comics or whatever you want to call them, art comics or literary comics, they were exploding. They were really taking off at the same time and uh, starting to win all sorts of literary awards and they were finding their way into all the best bookstores and getting written up by um, people in the New York Review of Books. And So simultaneously, the, the what we think of as mainstream comics were sort of sliding down downwards but their content they were content providers so they were um, for the entertainment industry and the content was going nuts it was enormously successful but also the comics that had always been outside of that mainstream field they were growing and growing too and then we get to where they are today <laughs> wherever comics are today good god yeah and and in Sam Sable and the Magic Pen you it's a, sort of a spiritual follow up to Hicksville which features the character Sam who's in Hicksville as well um, you have this notion of because you've removed geography as a factor now now it's now the internet has arrived and you've collapsed all that sense of space so you, if you produce a comic in one country a person in the side of the world can read it on Tumblr and that is your depiction of how things have shifted since Hicksville came out. Um, is that something you you still observe to be true, that people are having more freedom to produce comics now, that there's less of a commercial hindrance or a cost uh, prohibition with, with money and where you need to be, and you can just produce comics wherever you are? Yes, yeah. I, yeah, I do think that... Um there's never really been a better time to be making comics. Um, it's so easy to produce them and get them out there. Um, but also, there's such enormous range and diversity of comics at the moment that that 
Uh, when I started doing comics, um, it still felt unusual when you came across a comic by a woman. Um, today, uh, it feels like comics are on the brink of becoming... Um, you know, there's talk about parity in the comics industry, and I think the mainstream part of the industry is still some some way from achieving that. But but outside the mainstream industry, I'd say maybe we've passed that point. Mm. Um, it's beyond parity now. Certainly, certainly the cartoonists, the the emerging cartoonists whose work I see, and whose work I feel, you know, this this is really important. This is the future of comics. I'm, I'm most mostly women. <laughs> That's yeah. That's an extraordinary extraordinary change from when I was first involved in comics um, all those years ago, and 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 not just women, but um, non-binary cartoonists and transgender cartoonists and queer cartoonists and cartoonists from all over the world and every ethnic background. I mean, it's a really exciting time for comics opening up. As a form, and every genre imaginable. Um, so it's it's, and also the history of comics is being re rediscovered and retold in different ways. Um, you know, those maps are being redrawn all the time. There are new maps being drawn of the history of comics. Uh, everything from Michael Tisserand's book about George Herriman, which really centres and foregrounds the fact that George Herriman was a a cartoon, a person of colour who was passing as white while he was nice. drawing Crazy Cat, and then yeah. rereading Crazy Cat in the light of that. This isn't exactly a new revelation. We we sort of have basically known the basic facts since the 70s, but as a New Orleans historian, Tisserand has really dug deep and and rereading Crazy Cat, which really is the one of the all-time great comics. Um, reading it in that, in the light of that, it's it reads very differently. You suddenly realise there are layers and layers of commentary on um, identity and race and racial narratives. And I mean, it's so fascinating. So, it's a really, really exciting time at the moment in comics. I would say the the internet explosion. Um, I have a lot of concerns at the moment about where the internet's going too, because I, in the early 2000s, I guess when I started writing the Magic Pen, um, I still had a sense of the internet as really um, leveling the playing field and mm. opening things up to everyone. At the moment, but even then, there was a, there were the beginnings of a feeling that the internet was going to become a battleground between. Um, governments and corporations and everyone else for control over the internet. And at the moment, I feel like everyone else <laughs> us. You know, we've we've lost that fight at the moment. I, I don't know if the fight's over. It'd be lovely to get some more progress. But at the moment, it feels like the internet is increasingly controlled and locked down by a, an unholy combination of. Um, corporations and states uh, and so we're increasingly being guided by algorithms and mm. and um, everything else yeah. funneled towards um, ever more popular commercial properties mm. um, and yeah so I'd and say it's slightly less wide open than it was the internet's less wide open than it was 10 years ago and it's also being used. It's again we come back to cartography. But it's it's being used to try and remap what has happened to comics and push back towards a more retrograde version of comics. Yeah, uh, well, it's particularly, interesting, particularly that... where women are concerned. Again, this is notion of um, if you have a woman character, she should be a sex object, like Dick Berger's uh, Lady Night. That's that's the version of women in comics that is preferred by certain certain groups. Let's say. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not so. I mean, well, I am very worried about about all of the the alt right and the manosphere and all of those battles at the moment in general terms. For comics, I feel like they feels to me like they're fighting a losing battle. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I hope so. Um, I hope they're losing. But, uh, yeah, it, it, the backlash is intense at the moment, but it feels to me in comics like a backlash. It feels like the, the, the change and the progress is so enormous yep. um, that they're going to lose that fight. But, it, but actually, in terms of mapping um, the internet as a whole... Um, I, my wife's involved in um, health research and she's there's been a lot of talk about the use of big data um, in health policy so uh, taking all the data that we can uh, can gather um, online and through our digital lives and digital footprints and using that to try and get um, find out new things about um, about the landscape of our of the world's health issues, uh, and so I think about that a lot. I, the, the internet at the moment is is becoming this huge data landscape, mm. which we're all feeding more data into, and what's happening now is that both corporations and governments are using that data to map. The landscape of our lives and just like any mapping um, the assumptions you take into that that cartographic enterprise will shape the results and once you draw a map based on those assumptions you start to see the world through that assumptions the landscape starts to be defined by the map and I mean this is kind of this has been one of my obsessions all along. It, it's a big part of Hicksville and the essay on Scott and um, and Atlas, my unfinished <laughs> unfinished epic, which I still pull out now and then and, and work on, uh, which is about a cartographer and cartoonist mm. who appears in Hicksville as well. Um, so I, I, I'm really interested in the way uh, the internet is providing an opportunity for people to construct a new map of everything and of all of our lives in a way that will inevitably distort that reality um, in potentially quite damaging ways. Mm. That was quite a big digression. I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was lovely. Um, I, I'm, I think we're, we're going to wrap up uh, because you, you've gone on a bit of a magical mystery tour of Hicksville and all the things that Hicksville touches on. And as I said before, every time I read it, I discover new things and new entry points and it sends me off on new digressions on my own. Um, so, listen, congratulations on 20 years. This is a fantastic <laughs> piece of work and uh, uh, long may it continue and um, really looking forward to seeing what you come up with next, man. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure talking to you. Uh, is there anything you'd like to touch on before we go? Is there anything, or maybe would you like to point people to where they can find you? What's coming up next? Yeah, so online, my main, um, you can mostly find me on hicksvillecomics.com. It's the best starting point. Um, and I'm on Twitter as Dylan Horrocks and so on. Um, the book I'm working on at the moment is about Dungeons and Dragons, and oh, that was something I was going to ask you about, but I, <laughs> I left yeah. it off. Yeah, well, you on. see, again, it's all about maps. Yes, <laughs> it's about creating, exactly. but it's about maps of imaginary worlds. Um, so that's uh, that's a long, slow. It, it takes me a long time to do a book. So don't hold your breath, people, but um, there will be something eventually. Hicksville is published by Drawn and Quarterly. Thanks to our patrons for supporting Deconstructing Comics and our other podcasts. To join them, go to patreon.com slash deconcomics. Patrons get access to podcasts about the early years of The Amazing Spider-Man, Jim Starlin's run on Captain Marvel, and more. Be sure to check out our Facebook group. A number of other people, including Kumar, share interesting links there. You can find the link to Discussion Group Facebook at DeconstructingComics.com, as well as our Facebook page and our X and YouTube accounts. From our site, you can also follow the link to shop at Amazon to support the show. Find links to subscribe to the podcast. 
leave a comment on any episode on our site, or leave us a voicemail, or you can write to us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com. Are you making a comic? Send it to us and we'll do a Critiquing Comics episode about it. The 2018 Deconstructing Comics theme is from bensound.com. Next week, another episode of our former Patreon show, Tim Catches Up with the MCU. Mulele and I discuss Captain Marvel. So until then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. Thank you.